Peter has been very, very influential in the whole area of, of legal and constitutional reforms with women in mind. And uh, legislation, if you talk now of the recent uh, marriage law, the recent domestic violence law, the recent matrimonial property law, uh, all those are, um, have been the result of initiatives from for the movement lawyers and uh, the federation in, in particular, and constitution making. So we went in and we were confronted with all these issues. And uh, come the 1990s, we had this greater move uh, by the country for, for democratization of the country because. Uh, um, the government had become very, very despotic, uh, very, very undemocratic. We know the amendments that had been done to the independent constitution, which had centralized power into the presidency, and completely um, uh, made that uh, uh, the presidency very, very uh, despotic. And, and we know the human rights abuses that went hand in hand with, with, with that. And uh, we all know um, how the uh, struggle for, for democratization um, uh, began. And, and as women also, as civil society, we joined in. First and foremost, to influence the greater democratic movement but specifically to ensure that uh, women issues which have been lacking in the old constitution are also taken in on board. And so in the 90s we got very busy, we got into that struggle. And, uh, and so that's how I got in there uh, as chair of FIDA at some stage. Uh, I was uh, I, I I was on the Ufanko Fungamano process under the People's Commission uh, that had been formed in 1998 to counter uh, the government move to form a commission that would undertake constitutional reforms at that time. Um, and people didn't trust the government at all. They did not trust the government, they didn't think the government which had oppressed them for that long is the same government which can give them uh, a, 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 an equitable um, a, a people's constitution. So the opposition, the civil society, the religious people uh, opposed that unilateral move on the part of the government which had formed its own um, constitution uh, uh, parliamentary um, uh, committee to oversee constitution making. It was chaired by uh, the Honorable Raila Odinga, whose NDP party had joined um, the government. So the civil society, the women's movement, the opposition parties, uh, the religious. Uh, community formed the Ufungamano Initiative and uh, they started to run a parallel uh, constitution making process chaired by, uh, it was called by the People's Commission, chaired by the late uh, Dr. Oke Okombaka, uh, chaired by the late Oki o Dr. Oki Okombaka. So Moi's uh, initiative was going on, and the Ufungamano initiative was also going on. Parallel uh, processes, one enjoying legality, and the other one enjoying legitimacy. Okay? And people trusted the Ufungamano one because uh, they, they couldn't trust the government. So we were in it, um, people like uh, Prof. 
kwanza wacha kukabiri ndipo bidai ya roni one reboys and clenola Access to land, 
socioeconomic rights, etc. It's because of the effort of we women who served in the constitution making uh, process. So between uh, 2005 and uh, 2007, I think that there was a general lull in the in the in the movement after the defeat of the uh, Wapa draft. Uh, then of course we had the 2007 elections and the horrible aftermath uh, that resulted uh, the country completely on the brink of, of, of war and we know the lost people. So after that there were the initiatives to to contain the situation and the part of the initiative was to revive the constitution making process uh, so that Kenyans get a constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2007, the 2008, I think so, the Constitution of Kenya Review Act, uh, within which framework we had uh, operated, was uh, amended, I think so, and uh, the Committee of Experts was, was appointed. And the duty of the Committee of Experts was to look at the contentious issues, what what had become contentious at Bomas, um, not the entire document, but there were contentious issues which had to do, I think, with the position of the Cathy courts. It had to do with devolution. It had to do with the uh, with the. Uh, the system of government, I think, whether we wanted a parliamentary system or, 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 or presidential system, those were sticking issues. And so the COE was to resolve those sticking issues. But basically using the Bomber's uh, draft, the Waco draft, uh, to come up with a harmonized draft. And that is what they did. So we got the new constitution in 2010. And after that promulgation uh, of the constitution, uh, you subsequently became the deputy chief justice. Could you maybe give us your experience? Now, as we were making the constitution, as we went around seeking the views of the one of the most vexing institutions in the country was the judiciary. Uh, people were very, very disillusioned about the judiciary. They didn't trust it. They thought it had done little to protect their rights. Uh, they thought there was a lot of corruption there. Uh, they thought there was a lot of incompetence there because of the nature of the appointment of judges, it was nepotistic, it was tribal, there was no systematic um, um, professional way. Uh, if you knew people there, then you became a judge. Whether you are, you are competent or not, did not matter. So, Kenyans were very, very unhappy with institutions in general, but in particular, the, the judiciary. And so uh, we were drafting the constitution, we had a chapter on the judiciary, although the judiciary never wanted to be part of the reform, but we are like, but the reason Kenyans want a new constitution is because of the judiciary, first and foremost. So it was a, a struggle. Um, and we were putting in the requirements. What do people want? People want a competent judiciary, a clean judiciary, not corrupt, an effective judiciary, um, independently appointed, financially independent, etc. So I, I, I had 
I had issues with the entire appointment of judges. It hadn't been transparent in the past. And uh, as we made the constitution, I thought I would try my luck and see if I can apply and be interviewed. So that I go there because I, I merited to go there. And so when uh, they advertised for the newly created uh, uh, judges of the Supreme Court, and of course who comprised a Chief Justice, and a newly created uh, position of the Deputy Chief Justice, um, I decided to, to apply. And uh, as luck could have it, I, it was a very, very competitive process, extremely competitive. Uh, but I emerged top. And, uh, in fact, when I went for parliamentary approval, I think all the marks from the Judicial Service Commission were there, and uh, I understand I scored the highest among the, the positions of Chief Justice and Deputy. So had I applied for Chief Justice, I would have become the first uh, woman Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. But uh, I had applied for Deputy, actually. So, so I got uh, the Deputy Chief Justice, and uh, so I became the first ever woman Deputy Chief Justice and the Vice President of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Kenya. And uh, I served uh, until 2012 when I, I resigned because of an incident, a very unintended incident and that happened uh, between me and, and, and a guard in, uh, in the, the village market. And I should say, uh, part of it was political. I was judged very, very harshly. Uh, not that people should not be held accountable, but if you use the Nancy as, as a standard, uh, of accountability, then see it through for everybody. Every Kenyan sees uh, people doing worse things and uh, nothing happens. After I was beaten so hard by everybody. And now they just look at people, get away literally with murder. So I keep saying uh, it was a bit too harsh on me, they were, it was political. And uh, I think there are sections of people who didn't want me there. But I'm happy I served as the first Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. Very, very awesome experience, of course. Uh, I didn't sit there alone, but I uh, participated on the first advisory opinion by the Supreme Court. Uh, if you look at that one, then you will see uh, my signature there as the Deputy Chief Justice and Vice President of the Supreme Court. And for me, that marked the fact that women, that we had a constitution which had given women an opportunity to compete. And actually, when I applied, I wanted to see if the new dispensation can allow people who could otherwise never have been appointed under the old dispensation uh, to get appointed. And, uh, I think for me, that was a uh, good opening uh, for women, and I would encourage them, women, to use the new constitutional openings to rise into positions of leadership. Maybe your opinion on the adversary opinion on the two third gender On the two third gender rule, now that one came after left. But I have done, uh, I teach about it, I have done a bit of research on it. Um, I think it was unfortunate in the sense that it, 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 uh, it disorganized 
the women's move to uh, realizing the constitutional provisions on, on affirmative action. Uh, Article 28 is clear on uh, affirmative action. Article 81, which talks about um, representation, is clear about what the state should do in order to ensure uh, that women um, attain at least 30%, which is the critical mass for any decision making to, to, to happen. Um, the, the constitution is clear. But Article 177, whereas it is clear on how to achieve that one third critical mass for women representation in the county assemblies and senate, is clear. It is not clear on how. It doesn't provide on how uh, to to do that at the national assembly and senate, and so that creates a problem. And that is why uh, the advisory opinion number two of 2012 was sought uh, by the attorney general uh, to see how, what direction the court would give, the Supreme Court would give uh, to, uh, to ensure that uh, there is realization of, of, of the one third gender uh, representation in the National Assembly and Senate. Of course, the Supreme Court, by majority of, uh, decision, uh, uh, thought that uh, realization of, the, of Article 27 should be progressive. Uh, C.J. Mutunga descended, and very rightly so, that it, it, it should be immediate. It can't be progressive. Had I been there, I think I would have sided with uh, the Chief Justice, the then Chief Justice, but unfortunately I wasn't there in any event, we would still have been in a minority. The reason I say it is unfortunate is because I have read the, the judgment. I have looked at the philosophy of, of affirmative action. First and foremost, why the one-third gender rule, which has now been adopted, as even by the UN, as the critical mass that is required if you are to have an impact on decision making. Okay? So it cannot be progressive. If you want to make decisions, and women representation is important for making decisions at the, uh, at the parliament level, transformative decision because of the, the value that women's representation brings. So I do not see how that should be progressing. So in my humble view, they missed out on the philosophy that underpins the one third gender representation. Okay, then we miss out on why we should have at least one third of either gender representation at decision making. It can't be progressive. Because progressive, what is happening in between? So they missed out on the philosophy. Secondly, I think they, uh, they were not bold enough to, to make a decision that can move the agenda of women ahead. They did it. They, they did it and it. And uh, of course we know what that has done to the entire um, effort to realize the one third gender rule. It took away the, the fire the, from the process of realizing the one third gender rule. So it talked about realization by uh, August 2015. Okay. August 2015 has come and gone. Did you make a judgment in vain 
courts should not make judgments in vain. I think they, they completely um, evaded their role to give the country direction uh, about uh, the one third gender. They did. So that is the much I can say about it. Uh, it has removed the women's agenda. Uh, August 2015 came and went. We are we have been holding an unconstitutional parliament since 2013. We are headed for a new parliament 2017. Nobody is talking about the one third gender rule. And so we are headed for again uh, an unconstitutional parliament. Okay? And yet it could have been definite about, about that. That's, that's the much I can say about the, the dilemma has been on how to do it. Do you, do you have anything to say on how to realize the one thing? Especially if I think there have been bills. There have been the Dwale bill which proposed, it has proposals mm -hmm. on, on how to realize. I think it proposed the lifting of Article. Uh, 177 to 190 to 90, 97 and 98. I think so. Yeah. And I think if they had been serious about it, they could have done it. We have had the Sijeni bill, which I think yesterday something happened to it, it was defeated. It had some proposals. We have had. Uh, of course, the Chepkonga one is a bit a uh, backward move. It, it cannot help women. It, it merely uh, uh, echoes the progressive uh, proposition by the Supreme Court. It doesn't move women. It, 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 it has the clawback effect uh, on, on the gains that, that women have made. But there have been proposals. I think the Dwale, two, uh, Dwale one was would have given us a framework. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, maybe you could give us your parting shot or your advice to the Maybe before we go to the parting shot, mm -hmm. Justice. Mm -hmm. um, I have one question. Now that you've been in the judiciary, mm -hmm. either on the bench or in the bar, mm -hmm. um, do you think that courts, as they were and they are today, do you think there are some changes that has happened whereby we can say women rights are now it's now possible to enforce women's rights unlike it was before? I think there have been uh, some fundamental changes in the in the in the courts, in the sense that now we have more judges, uh, that they are independently appointed, that the judiciary has financial autonomy. And there are a lot of resources at that, and it has actually done a lot of outreach. It is in every county, I think so. I think that is a good move, but uh, speed. And you know when there is when 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 there, there are delays. I I do not think we have reached a stage where we can say now you can go to court and next week you have a judgment. It's not happening. In fact, they have gone back to where they were. Eh? Judgments are sitting for two years and beyond. And we don't know what the problem is. Eh? Because I know, I know so many matters that are still now, we've just gone backwards. Why this is happening, I don't know. And yet there are so many judges. Okay? So that one is not good. As to whether women are being served, I think there have been very progressive judgments. The High Court, I should single out the High Court, and uh, Justice Lenaola, and uh, uh, as he then was in the, the High Court, now his Supreme Court, and uh, Justice uh, Mumbi. There have been very, very progressive uh, judgments uh, in favor of women in terms of just upholding their human rights. Uh, matrimonial property decisions are quite progressive, some of them of course. Um, 
land, access to land. Um, progressive judgment on, 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 on children. So to some extent, um, there have been progressive judgments. But the Supreme Court, I think, hasn't inspired. It, it, it hasn't um, it hasn't served the cause of women. First and foremost, the advisory opinion has taken women backwards. It never gave them direction. And uh, when you look at, uh, there was a challenge in the Supreme Court uh, filed by FIDA, FIDA Kenya, to challenge the composition of the Supreme Court itself. The one third gender rule was not met. And uh, is, it, uh, is that the same case? No, no, that advisory opinion was separate from this one. And, and, and again, the, the, the court, the court did not give very good direction. So it has perpetuated the, the unconstitutionality of, of, of state institution, including itself. So it, uh, I should say there has been not been good progress at this report, but the High Court, I think, some judges have done pretty well. Uh, another question. Um, in many interviews that we've done, I've heard many of the, of the interviewees saying that the women movement has kind of derailed in the past maybe 10, 15 years, and like it was before. What do you think that might be some of the reasons the, of the jailment? Do you think the, the women are feeling they have achieved so there is no need for fighting? Or what do you think might be the problem? Or in, in first instance, do you believe that the, the women movement has derailed and like it was before? And if you feel so, what are the reasons? What do you think to be the reasons for that? Maybe you can follow that up. Actually, there are some who felt that the women's movement is dead, not even actually derailed. So what, what do you think and what is the way forward? I think it is weaker than it was. It is uh, disjointed, if you ask me. And uh, as I told you, I've been studying the journey on the one third gender rule. And there have been so many initiatives on one thing, so many initiatives, uh, so that you don't know what is what. You get it? Uh, the parliamentarians, uh, I think women parliamentarians, Kewopa, had even their own bill. Then there is the Sijeni bill. Then there is the Dwale bill. Then there is the Dwale number two. Then. There are so many initiatives coming from everywhere. And on an important thing like that one, I think, uh, a, a very powerful, organized women's movement uh, could, could have done it differently. And that's what we did uh, when we, we, we were doing the Constitution. We put our heads together and uh, we, we were extremely powerful. But now, um, I, I think uh, I think the fire has uh, has, has cooled. I don't know. Um, the reason we fought so hard, you know, fighting for the greater democracy, fighting for the women in a very very vicious environment. We risked our lives, we risked our careers, we, you know, it was very, very violent. So that uh, when we eventually got the Constitution, I think some of us thought we had arrived. I thought we had arrived because we got the constitutional guarantees. And I think we were under the expectation that uh, the state will do its bit put in place legislation for realization of the constitution, okay? But then that is not happening. And in fact, the patriarchy has re reared its head, whether it is in the judiciary, whether it's in parliament, and when you look at the debate about the one-third gender rule, the debate is whether it is necessary. And yet that is a constitutional requirement. 
oh women want free things, oh women are joy riders, they go back and they struggle like like men do. Completely um, misunderstanding the reason for affirmative action. Okay, it it it, it is it is. Uh, it is necessitated by so many factors. The fact of patriarchy, the fact of the disempowerment of women, historical disempowerment. So you, the reason we have it in the constitution is first and foremost, women could not compete on a level ground field with, with men. And, and affirmative action is now an accepted method uh, through quota systems to increase the number of women in leadership, be it in, uh, uh, in parliament or other public uh, offices. It's, it's accepted. And so it's very sad when now you hear the debate, oh, women don't need it. Since when did they stop needing it? And where are you coming from? Not to know that it is now a constitutional requirement. The debate is very disappointing, very archaic debates and narratives around women empowerment, which is very, very sad. Okay. So I think probably we assumed too much as women that uh, we have a right. And the people were tired, completely tired. You spend your life running street battles. And now you've gotten the constitution that guarantees you. But now we realize really uh, the struggle can never end. Okay? And so I think there needs to be revamping of the women's movement. It is a bit disjointed now, but it is weak. Yeah. Maybe my just, just one last question. Now that you ventured into academia, uh, the high the tertiary level of teaching. So what are you doing currently? Because uh, I, I believe for the women movement and the women rights to be a continuous process, everyone must do something wherever she is. So currently, what are you doing to ensure that uh, the women rights are perpetuated, the succession? Because uh, you do not want the, the process to come to a standstill. What are you doing in academia to make sure that the process will be successful and that uh, your gains will be passed to the young generation that you are teaching? In academia, um, there is a lot that one does as a teacher. First and foremost, you are teaching everybody and you are teaching about the ideals of the constitution, which include uh, affirmative action and women empowerment. We teach about uh, the history of the women's movement in the country. Uh, we teach about the need for realization of, uh, of women empowerment as uh, required by the Constitution. So, so I'm teaching. I'm teaching um, very vibrant young people. And I'm happy to say the men that, are going, that we are going to have in the near future uh, have different attitudes towards women because in my class they, it's, it's not an issue it is like yeah this is a constitution why are we playing around with it and when you explain the need for women empowerment they understand I teach I teach them in uh, feminist theory I teach them uh, in social foundations of law and uh, the role that uh, women play in development, and so they understand. So in that way, you are infusing a new value system in both the young men and, and the women. Uh, so that uh, one keeps uh, hoping that uh, the narrative around women empowerment is going to change. And these are young people who are going to be parliamentarians, they are going to be judges, they are going to be out there, prosecutors, they are all over the place. I think if we do our job well, which I believe I do very well, I teach very well. I've been told by my students that I teach well. So, yeah, so we, we try to infuse a new value system in, 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 in our teaching. And, and that is very...
very very powerful. Yeah. Now you can give us a funny shot. I don't know what it is you you, you are doing. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, as you approach, maybe your your touch can be this perspective. As you approach it now, the uh, three seventy generations are going to have a new government. And uh, now the defeat of this JDP yesterday means that we are going to have another initiative in the new government after six months or so. Uh, what's your that one mark to the remaining parliamentarians who are going to run successfully and then form the next government? I think women parliamentarians should carry the the battle forward. First and foremost, I will encourage as many women as possible to run for elective posts. They should, they especially the beneficiaries of the affirmative action in the ending parliament. They are now empowered uh, to be able to run and leave those seats for others to be nominated so you create a critical mass. I think they, 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 they should do that. And when they get into parliament, I think they should, uh, one complaint I have heard about women parliamentarians is that uh, they don't see, I, I think they have done a good job in the midst of a lot of patriarchy, but probably they should, uh, um, they should, uh, from lobbies outside parliament, uh, the women, grassroots women, women out there, uh, they should reconnect and, and revamp uh, a strengthened women's movement. Uh, people have said that uh, they are acting slightly in isolation up there, and yet the women's movement out there is the one which actually gave us the most. They should engage more uh, academics. I don't know why they don't. Because sometimes you listen to the debates there. And, uh